Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 28, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 77. Early this month, on July 6, there was an unusual news report from Russia. That day an Aeroflot jet transport had crashed on takeoff from Moscow Sheremetyevo Airport. It was a spectacular flaming crash that killed all 90 persons on board. What was unusual about this news item was that it was made public so quickly. Usually plane crashes in Russia are announced more quietly and often after a delay of hours or even days, but not this time. The Aeroflot flight that crashed on July 6 was an international flight bound for Africa. Some of the passengers were students returning to their homes in Sierra Leone and Senegal. Under the circumstances, Russian authorities had no choice but to release the news without delay. Within hours it was included in news reports around the world. Within hours after the Moscow tragedy, investigators at the scene discovered that this had been no ordinary plane crash. In the midst of the twisted smoking wreckage of what had been the Aeroflot plane, conclusive proof of sabotage was found. A report about the sabotage was flashed to KGB headquarters in Zhezhensky Square in Moscow. There the report was directed to a special task group assigned to deal with growing acts of internal disruption in the Soviet Union. A mounting campaign to create internal turmoil in Russia is going on, created by Bolshevik agents there. So far there has been little news about this in the West but it's a real and deepening problem. Within 36 hours the KGB Special Task Group was able to confirm what had been suspected. The sabotage of the Aeroflot jet had been carried out by one of the Bolshevik disruption groups which had been under surveillance in the Moscow area. These groups, like others all across Russia, are being financed and directed by the Bolsheviks here, now headquartered in the United States. The KGB notified the Kremlin of the results of its investigation of the Aeroflot sabotage early on July 8, just two days after the crash. Those suspected of having carried out the sabotage were under arrest, but the question remained how to send a message to the Bolsheviks in the United States to cease and desist from similar acts. It does no good to talk to America's present rulers. Action of some kind was required and fast. Various possibilities were discussed and rejected for various reasons. Retaliation for the Aeroflot crash had to be designed to convey a clear message to the American Bolsheviks in terms they understand. The message the Kremlin wanted to send was, We know what you did to our plane. We have the means to destroy you and the will to use it if necessary. For the message to be effective, time was of the essence and so a Target of Opportunity order was given jointly to the KGB and the Russian Space Command. The KGB was ordered to select an American airliner for destruction within 24 hours. The criterion for selection was to be a passenger list as similar as possible to that of the sabotage Aeroflot plane. The Aeroflot plane had carried many foreign passengers and a total of 90 persons had been aboard. Therefore the KGB was ordered to select a commercial airliner in the United States with similar characteristics. That is, there must be at least 90 persons aboard and an unusually high proportion of foreign passengers. The Russian Space Command would then have the responsibility of destroying the airliner on takeoff, just like the Aeroflot plane. KGB agents here in the United States had little difficulty in selecting not one but several candidate flights. Thanks to America's cross-connected computerized airline reservation system, the task was relatively easy. The Russian Space Command was then free to choose whichever flight was most convenient to attack. As in the past, it was decided to mount the attack using bad weather as an operational cover. On the afternoon of July 9, summer rainstorms were moving in patches through southeastern Louisiana. They were the kind of thunderstorms that build up in the heat and humidity of scorching summer afternoons. 
It was an on-again, off-again rainstorm, locally heavily at times, then slacking off to a few sprinkles. At New Orleans International Airport it continued to be business as usual on that rain-swept afternoon. Weather conditions like these were a familiar occurrence, and the airport was equipped to monitor them closely. At around 4 p.m. that afternoon, airport sensors detected a condition of disorganized air movement called wind shear. Warnings were broadcast to airplanes in the area so that they could take it into account. Meanwhile, flight operations continued without let-up. Rain or no rain, the weather was still far better than the minimums required for flight. As the wind shear warning was broadcast to pilots, a number of planes were preparing to take off. One of these was a Pan American 727, Flight 759, bound for Las Vegas. The pilot heard the wind shear warning and decided to take appropriate action to guard against it. The faster a plane is moving, the less vulnerable it is to shear. So when Pan American Flight 759 headed down the runway, the pilot held the nose down longer than normal. By waiting a few extra moments, he allowed the 727 to pick up extra speed as a margin of safety. Then he lifted the nose and the plane jumped off the runway and started climbing. Other planes, some of them smaller and more vulnerable to wind shear than a 727, took off before and after Pan Am Flight 759. All of them did so without mishap. The Flight 759 was destined to be less fortunate. This was the third day after the Sabotage Aerofloat jet had crashed in Moscow. Pan American Flight 759 had the required load of more than 90 persons. It also satisfied the criterion of an unusually large number of foreign passengers in excess of 20 percent. And although Flight 759 was a domestic flight, the plane itself belonged to America's International Flag Airline, Pan American. The parallels with the Sabotage Aerofoot flight were judged to be more than adequate, and so as the Pan Am jet rotated upward off the runway, a Russian Cosmosphere was waiting, hovering in the clouds over the airport. A moment after the jet left the runway, it was hit by what witnesses described as a bolt of lightning, quote unquote. What they actually saw, my friends, was a surgical blast from a charged particle beam weapon. It was fired down at the jet by the Russian Cosmosphere hiding in the clouds overhead. It is not surprising that the witnesses mistook this for a lightning bolt. Whenever charged particle beam weapons are discussed in public, they are most often described as producing a sort of man-made lightning bolt. But a charged particle beam only looks like a lightning bolt. What it does is far more destructive than lightning. The beam blast was aimed very precisely at the air intake mounted in the tail of the 727. The blast blew superheated air and debris into the center engine, ruining it. The fringes of the blast also damaged and interfered with the other two engines mounted nearby. As the jet lost power, witnesses saw it stop climbing normally and start mushing along through the air. Less than half a mile from the end of the runway, the plane clipped a tree as it descended toward a crowded residential area. The doomed jetliner passed right over a woman who later told reporters it was spitting and popping like it couldn't get the motor running. Moments later the dying jetliner was crashing, cartwheeling, and exploding through four blocks of Kenner, Louisiana. Stunned residents who had been narrowly missed by the crash looked across the street in horrified disbelief. Where moments before there had been neighbors' houses, there was now a firestorm. A wall of angry flames towered twenty stories into the air. All 145 people aboard the plane had perished, along with eight more on the ground. My friends, the Air Folk crash in Moscow and the Pan Am crash three days later in New Orleans were not just tragic accidents. The victims in those tragedies were casualties in the secret war between the United States and Russia. Barring a miracle, all-out war is on the horizon, and if it comes, it will come suddenly, just as destruction came suddenly to a suburb of New Orleans earlier this month. In recent days top leaders of both the United States and Russia have started speaking openly 
of war. Both sides are now saying that the United States and the Soviet Union are already at war, which is true. But the secret warfare which has been going on for years now is only a pale shadow of things to come. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The growing momentum toward NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Topic No. 2. America's domestic shift onto a war footing. And Topic No. 3. The rising pitch of Russian anti-war warnings. Topic No. 1. Early last month, from June 4 to June 6, the Eighth Economic Summit took place between the United States and six other leading industrial nations. The summit was hosted by France with the usual pomp and ceremony. The summit was supposed to enable a meeting of minds which would result in a more unified approach to solving the world's economic problems. But the entity known as President Reagan went there with different goals in mind. The Bolshevik-dominated Reagan Administration is preoccupied with thoughts of war and intrigue, not with building a better world. Because of this radical difference in viewpoint, Reagan was out of step with the other leaders at the summit from start to finish. It was symbolized at the very beginning when all the leaders were flown to the Palace of Versailles in the blue and white French helicopters. All that is except President Reagan. He refused to ride in a French helicopter, arriving instead in his own Marine Corps chopper. A matter of security, someone said. The Reagan obsession with security at Versailles verged on paranoia. For example, he took his own supply of drinking water to France aboard Air Force One. Why? because he just did not trust French water, even the many kinds of world-famous French bottled water. Just a matter of security, someone said. The French were offended when they heard about Reagan's boycott of French water, but what really insulted them was the way he behaved toward the exquisite French cuisine at the Versailles Palace. While all the other world leaders were relaxing and enjoying themselves, Reagan was behaving as if someone was out to get him. Reagan has two members of the Secret Service who are assigned as food tasters, like those for royalty of old. He will eat nothing until they have tasted it first. If the food tasters don't die, he concludes that the food is not poisoned and eats it. When the Reagan food tasters invaded the Versailles Palace kitchens, the chefs were incensed. To question French food is to demean the very glory of the French Republic. As one indignant chef told reporters, our own President has no food tasters. He trusts French food. If the Reagan paranoia displayed at Versailles had been limited to matters of food and drink, it might have been shrugged off as unimportant. But the fact is that during the talks themselves the United States was even more out of line. Our trading partner said, let's work out a way to bring down high interest rates which are killing our economies. The so-called Reagan team replied, let's cut off trade credits to Russia in order to kill the Russian economy. The Europeans said, we're vulnerable to economic catastrophe due to our near total dependence on Middle East and Persian Gulf oil. A war in the region could cripple us overnight. We must protect ourselves by obtaining a second source of energy. Therefore we must help build the Siberian pipeline to bring us natural gas from Russia. But the Reagan team replied, If you build the pipeline, Russia will benefit too, so don't build it. As the conference broke up, there were reports in the press that the United States had angered the other nations there. Instead of working to solve our own problems, the Reagan Administration was interested only in making problems for Russia. After the economic summit broke up early last month, the Reagan entourage continued an extended trip through Europe. On June 9 and 10 a summit of NATO leaders was held in Bonn, West Germany. In the final closed session of the summit, the entity Reagan gave a summary statement so warlike that it stunned everyone else into silence. European diplomats are so worried by what Reagan said that early this month some of them started telling the press about it. The controlled major media here in America have carefully avoided highlighting this ominous story, but just over two weeks ago on July 11, 
A syndicated article about it was published by Newsday. The article begins, and I quote, President Reagan stunned allies at the NATO summit by telling them that as far as he is concerned, the Soviet Union is at war with the United States, European officials said last week. The statement, which came as the President was summing up his views on the two-day meeting in Bonn, so surprised the other heads of state that they remained silent, and NATO Secretary General Joseph Lunds immediately adjourned the session according to these officials who were present at the summit a month ago." Unquote. My friends, for several years now I've been reporting on the secret war that is raging between the United States and the Soviet Union. Up until now the fact that war is already underway between the superpowers has never been admitted by either side, but this is a war that cannot remain secret forever. The momentum is building toward the moment when it will erupt into all-out war, NUCLEAR WAR ONE. And as that moment draws near, my friends, both sides are starting to speak of war in clear terms. At the NATO meeting on June 10, the alleged President Reagan said that the United States and Russia are already at war. Several weeks later a top Russian leader said much the same thing. On July 13, Pravda published a speech by the entity Marshal Ustinov, the Soviet Defense Minister. As I've explained in the past, anything attributed to Ustinov carries a great deal of authority. Ustinov declared that the United States is orchestrating a trade, credit, and technological war against the Soviet Union. He also gave a blunt warning to Washington that a, quote, Preemptive first strike use of nuclear weapons could not ensure an American victory." Unquote. Ustinov warning reflects the fact that Russia's new leaders know about the Reagan Administration plan to launch nuclear war soon, and they are preparing to defeat the Bolshevik-triggered American first strike if it is carried out. But the Bolsheviks here are not listening, my friends. As I've detailed in the past, the Bolshevik mentality is satanic and schizophrenic. Those obsessed by Bolshevik thinking are totally incapable of persuasion by normal reasoning. They see shadows like Reagan with his water jugs and food tasters in France. They're out of touch with reality as you and I know it, so they're plunging right ahead with their plans for nuclear war. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63 nearly 16 months ago, I outlined the five-track plan of the Bolsheviks here to lead us into nuclear war. As I reported then, all five tracks were designed to start coming together around mid-1982, in other words, now, and it is happening. Track 1 of the American Bolshevik War Plan called for stirring up as much internal turmoil as possible in Russia and her satellites. This is intended purely for distraction to keep Soviet authorities off balance. The most dramatic example of the ongoing campaign of internal harassment recently was the July 6 crash of the Sabotage Aerofolk jet in Moscow. Track 2 of the War Plan called for preparing the American people for war. That part of the War Plan has gone much farther than most people realize. We're becoming conditioned to the idea that getting ready for a nuclear war is the number one priority of the so-called Reagan Administration. A government which pretends to be bent on saving money is spending record amounts for military projects. At the same time, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, is vigorously publicizing alleged civil defense plans. The fact is that neither the new military projects nor the proposed new civil defense measures are expected to bear fruit for the general welfare of the public. Those things take time. And the Bolsheviks here intend for NUCLEAR WAR ONE to erupt long before that. The only real purpose of these things is to make us think in terms of war with Russia and to safeguard only the American Bolsheviks in their private war bunkers. Track 3 of the Bolshevik plan to prepare for war involves space, and in particular the Space Shuttle program. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I reported that a series of four initial missions were planned for military purposes. The story was to be fed to the public that these would be test flights. Elaborate preparations were made ahead of time to provide falsified television coverage of the orbital portion of each flight, 
This was done by means of advanced videotaping. Meanwhile, the actual military activities carried out by the Shuttle astronauts would not be seen by the public. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 63, the plan called for all four of these crash military space shuttle missions to be completed by mid-1982. That time has now arrived, and Space Shuttle 4 is history right on time. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 76 last month, the fourth Space Shuttle mission was in progress. I can now report that its primary mission, which I described last month, was successful. The secret Air Force cryogenic sensor system is now in geostationary orbit over the Indian Ocean. It is parked there, waiting to do its job about six weeks from now if the present Pentagon schedule is maintained. That job, my friends, will be to confirm success of Stage 1 of the planned American nuclear first strike against Russia. I can now report that Space Shuttle 4 also had a secondary mission which was not successful. It was piggybacked onto this mission in hopes of gaining additional intelligence over Russia. The laser-armed robot spy satellite which was launched by the third Space Shuttle did not last long, my friends. It did survive long enough to provide the basic new target information the Bolsheviks in the Pentagon wanted and it also picked up some unexpected additional information close to Russia's space bases. Strange installations of some kind are being built in many places in Russia, but Russian Cosmos Interceptor succeeded in destroying the Super Spy satellite before it could be reprogrammed to take a closer look at the sites. And so Space Shuttle 4 was given a piggyback mission. High-power surveillance equipment was mounted in the rear bay of the crew compartment to look out through the windows in the top. The arrangement was very much like what was done in the second shuttle last November 1981. The shuttle was launched initially into a minimum inclination orbit toward the equator as I reported last month. That was done to enable the Air Force sensor to be launched with its rocket booster into its high equatorial orbit. Then to carry out the second mission, a little publicized additional capability of the Space Shuttle was used for the first time. At the insistence of the military, the Shuttle was designed with the capability to change its orbital plane by a large amount. Space Shuttle 4 was initially in an orbit that went no farther north than Cape Canaveral. In order to do any spying on Russia, it was necessary to swing much farther north. The Shuttle accomplished this by changing its orbit less than 24 hours after launch. From its initial 28.5 degree orbit, the Shuttle fired its engines to achieve an orbit that took it above 40 degrees north. That was enough to take the Shuttle over southern Russia, where several of the mysterious new sites are located. By that point, the Space Shuttle had been converted to nothing more than a giant awkward spy satellite with lasers for self-defense, but it did not work. As soon as the Shuttle headed north, it was attacked and destroyed by Russian space weapons. So the Bolshevik war planners here still do not know what the Rush Rush new Russian installations are all about. Even so, the Bolsheviks here consider the secret mission of Space Shuttle 4 to be a great success. Their precious attack confirmation sensor is now in orbit, pointed at Russia. The final act in Shuttle Mission 4 was carried out on schedule with great fanfare on July 4. The final secret duplicate of the Space Shuttle Columbia swooped in to land at Edwards Air Force Base with the President watching. Afterwards the President gave a speech in which he gave lip service to future support for NASA, but the fact is, my friends, that the Bolsheviks here believe they have no further need for space research. They believe the secret military shuttle program has done its job and that they are now ready for NUCLEAR WAR ONE. In recognition of this fact, the entity Reagan carried out a military ceremony at Edwards Air Force Base after the shuttle landed. Major General James Abramson, who seized control of the shuttle for the military, was promoted to Lieutenant General. Abramson had nothing at all to do with developing the Space Shuttle but he has guided its secret use in preparing for war, and for that he was told in effect, well done. Track 4 in the elaborate Bolshevik plan to lead us into war called for the introduction of certain new offensive nuclear weaponry. 
That task is now essentially completed, my friends. The Minuteman TX Mobile ICBM missiles, which I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 55, are now deployed, and the stealth Phantom warplanes, which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 73, are being deployed now around Russia's borders. Track 5 of the plan called for a sudden mushrooming of simultaneous crises to provide the spark for war, and it is happening, my friends. The brutal Israeli invasion of Lebanon last month has dragged on with no solution in sight. Every time anyone suggests a way out of the crisis, the Begin Government says, no deal, and bombs Beirut again. And now, since July 14, the Persian Gulf War between Iran and Iraq is multiplying the instability in the region. Iran's thrust into Iraq is doing exactly what Israel wants throwing the Arab OPEC nations into disarray. The Iranian battle cry is, On to Jerusalem! But up to now, Jerusalem could not be more pleased. All this is paving the way for an Israeli limited nuclear strike to destroy Saudi Arabian oil wells, a secret plan which I first revealed nearly seven years ago and have updated a number of times since then. Elsewhere around the world the fires are multiplying. Savage new fighting has erupted between Somalia and Ethiopia. The war in Afghanistan is heating up, and in Central America the El Salvador War is now spreading to engulf Honduras and Nicaragua. So-called right-wing commandos from Honduras, trained, outfitted, and supplied by the CIA, are intensifying their attacks on Nicaragua. The United States is using troops and materiel from its Panama Canal base to help Honduras against Nicaragua. This has now placed the Panama Canal in dire jeopardy, just as I warned it would be in my book nine years ago. During August, world crises are being planned to multiply and get rapidly worse. The Pentagon's target date for nuclear war is still mid-September, my friends, and that is just around the corner. Topic No. 2 Last week on July 22, the Government of France issued what amounts to a Declaration of Independence against the United States of America. It consisted of a crisp two-paragraph statement issued in Paris. The statement ordered all French companies to honor their contracts to help build the Siberian gas pipeline from Russia to Europe. The French action was taken in angry defiance of the increasingly arrogant dictated to Europe by Washington. At the Seven Nation Economic Summit early last month, the pipeline had been discussed at length. As usual, the United States wanted to force Europe to back out of the deal. In exasperation, the Europeans explained over and over how vital the pipeline is to them. When the summit ended on June 6, the Europeans were left believing that the United States would respect their position, but as the French say, it had all been a dialogue of the deaf. On June 18, less than two weeks after the Economic Summit, the entity President Reagan announced new measures to try to scuttle the pipeline. Last December 1981 he had announced a ban on American companies providing equipment for the pipeline. On June 18, he expanded the ban internationally. He declared that even foreign companies operating in their home countries were banned from providing pipeline equipment if they make products under American licenses. It was a move with little or no foundation in international law. Instead, it was based on sheer intimidation of our allies. The French announcement of July 22 was Europe's answer. First came the announcement concerning French companies. Then, the same day, West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was interviewed on American television. He announced that France was not alone in her decision. Schmidt said, The pipeline will be built, and the British, the French, the Germans, and other Europeans will stick to the agreements which their firms have been making with the Soviets. On French television, Foreign Minister Claude Chasson revealed that a major rift is taking place between Europe and the United States. Speaking for France, he described what is happening as a progressive divorce. 
He also said, We no longer speak the same language. The feelings he expressed are spreading fast throughout the leadership of Western Europe. Even Britain, whose present government is dominated by Bolsheviks in the military sphere, is finding it necessary to side with Europe on the pipeline issue. My friends, we are now in the final pages of the events I outlined nine years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. What I made public then were deliberate, long-range economic and political plans and the inevitable consequences of those plans. The efforts of the Reagan Administration to sabotage the Siberian Gas Pipeline Project are a direct threat to vital European interests. In response, our longtime European allies are banding together to protect themselves. Sooner or later it had to come to this. This is what I meant in my book to the effect that Europe will no longer be cowed by United States blackmail. The breach now taking place between the United States and Europe is giving rise to fears of a major trade war. Those fears are well founded. Quoting from my book starting on page 102, As for America, she will go her own way, pushed by the momentum of the new imperialism. She will enter the tunnel of the big trade war with all of its self-protective devices. The free trade idea will have gasped its last breath." Unquote. It is happening now, my friends. Just three days ago, for example, an attempt to work out an agreement between Europe and the United States over steel imports collapsed. America's obsolescent steel industry is slowly going belly up as steel from Europe's more modern government-subsidized plants floods our market. Reagan's response is to further deepen the rift by slapping taxes or increased duties on imports of European products. Developments like these are the inevitable consequences of forces which were deliberately set in motion long ago, but they are also being manipulated to further the objectives of the American Bolsheviks who now dominate the so-called Reagan Administration. As they lead us down the path to nuclear war, they are also paving the way for their own total domination of America after the war. As I have detailed in past reports, they expect to survive the nuclear devastation which they plan to bring down upon the rest of us. If the war should get out of control and turn America into a hopeless wasteland, they are prepared to leave afterward and start over in the Southern Hemisphere. But the fact is, my friends, that they think NUCLEAR WAR ONE will be less disastrous than that. The Bolsheviks here believe that what is left of America after NUCLEAR WAR ONE will still be a prize worth having. They expect 40 to 60 million Americans to survive the war in rural areas and small towns. The major United States cities will be gone, but so will their unmanageable problems such as urban decay and runaway crime. America's vast natural resources will still be here ready to be exploited. The Bolsheviks intend to position themselves to be our taskmasters. They believe that a new Bolshevized America will rise from the ashes, and it will all be theirs to use however they choose. In all this, my friends, the Bolsheviks here are expecting to repeat what they did to take over Russia 65 years ago. It was the strain and suffering of World War I that finally made Russia vulnerable to a Bolshevik takeover. Now having lost their control of Russia at the hands of Russia's new anti-Bolshevik rulers, they plan to try again here. World War I gave them Russia, and they believe Nuclear War I will give them America. To help pave the way for their intended total post-war dictatorship over America, the Bolsheviks here are deliberately isolating us in the world. I've already described how the Reagan Administration is alienating Europe. Likewise, the White House is also hitting the Japanese where it hurts by banning equipment for joint Japanese and Russian oil projects. These are in the works in Siberia and on Sakhalin Island and would result in important new energy supplies for Japan. In Latin America, Reagan Administration policy has done enormous damage to America's image. In the Falklands War between Britain and Argentina, American open support for Britain was carried out in ways that angered all of Latin America. 
In the Middle East, the United States is losing its credibility with the Arabs with its attitude that Israel can do no wrong. As for Russia and the Soviet bloc, Reagan policies boil down to nothing but fish-shaking and golding. America's trade war against Russia is designed to turn the Cold War into a hot war. That is where trade wars always lead. In the 1930s, the United States used oil embargoes and trade boycotts to goad Japan into war, and the result was Pearl Harbor. And now the United States is using embargoes, boycotts, and sanctions to pave the way for war with Russia. My friends, in every way the United States is isolating itself. On July 9, the entity Reagan even announced that the United States will not sign the new Law of the Sea Treaty. That treaty took eight years to negotiate and has been signed by 130 nations. Only four nations so far have said a flat no to it and two of them are America and Israel. The self-inflicted isolation of America is deliberate, my friends. It's part of the Bolshevik strategy I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 63 to create a sort of Masada complex here in America, that is, turning in and upon itself. The more isolated America becomes, the more we will see ourselves as alone in a world with bitter enemies and no friends. The Bolsheviks here in America are using the same strategy as their Zionist partners in Israel. The Yorkshire Post in England summed up the Zionist thinking perfectly six months ago in an editorial on January 16, quote, The Super Hawks in the Israeli Government want the Israelis to feel unloved, unwanted, and vulnerable by the world, because then it can make it easier for the Government to argue for more security needs to take precedence over everything else." Unquote. That is what is happening in Begin's Israel, my friends, and that is what is happening in Reagan's America. America's isolation abroad is moving along hand in hand with measures to clamp down on Americans domestically. Several things are in the works to hit us in the pocketbook if the plans for imminent nuclear war should somehow be delayed. The plan to repudiate the $100 bill which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 63 is once again being examined. Large amounts of counterfeit $100 bills are now being made in Latin America using American plates formerly used by the CIA in Vietnam. This may be used as the excuse to cover to eliminate the $100 bill in a sudden repudiation. A new War Powers Act for economic purposes is also moving through Congress very quietly right now. It would authorize the President to impose wage and price controls, declare a bank holiday, close the stock markets, or take other measures by declaring a national economic emergency. Under that cover, Presidential War Powers would also be activated without the public being aware of it. The prospect of imminent nuclear war is also tied in to economic matters in other ways. Six months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 71, I reported that all the gold at the New York Assay Office of the United States Mint was being moved. It was being taken up the Hudson River to the West Point Depository, which was not designed for gold bullion storage. The reason given to employees was that it was for security purposes. Even though security at West Point is inferior to that at the assay office, now I can tell you what finally happened to that gold. The gold has been spirited out of the country in preparation for nuclear war here. It was shipped to Geneva, Switzerland by way of New Orleans, Louisiana, and France. The shipment was met by Swiss Army guards in France, and from there it went by train and then by truck to an underground depository in Geneva. It was signed for in Geneva on May 12, 1982. The custodian of the gold is a Geneva bank. President Reagan agreed to the entire transfer ahead of time. My friends, if history is any guide at all, this and other movements of gold are clear signs that war is expected soon by our so-called leaders. For centuries it has been customary for leaders of nations who know that war is imminent to move their gold to Switzerland for safekeeping. 
Lately not only the West Point Gold but other private gold hoards have been leaving America for Switzerland. Likewise in Britain the Rothschilds have lately been transferring their large gold holdings to Switzerland. In the case of the West Point Gold there is still one more important fact to report. This gold, gold rightly belonging to you and me, the citizens of America, has been consigned for the use of the Government of Israel. Israel is using it as collateral to finance continuing arms purchases at a staggering pace. Israel is secretly arming itself far beyond anything that could conceivably be needed to fight the Arabs alone. So the question is, why are all those weapons now being stockpiled in Israel? The answer is that Israel's Zionist warlords are expecting to have a bigger foe in the region soon. They are trying to drag Russia into the Middle East fighting on the way to nuclear war. All in all, the economy of the United States is being bled dry. Insatiable spending on sterile armaments is helping to fuel inflation as our dollars go for guns instead of butter. At the same time, record Federal borrowing is also keeping interest rates at business-killing levels. The result is stagflation, a stagnating economy with continuing inflation. If the plans for nuclear war do not cut it short, we are heading into a deep depression the likes of which we have never seen before. A depression with plenty of consumer goods in the stores, but great numbers of people without the money to buy them. Prices will be higher and higher for everything, with people selling their valuables in order to exist. There will be people moving in with relatives, old rooming houses filled by people who can no longer afford anything better. Families separated as people take any employment available anywhere. Long lines waiting to apply for government jobs and a little security. If nuclear war is somehow prevented or delayed, these are the things that are being brought upon us by the policies known as Reaganomics. But as it stands now, my friends, it may all be cut short very soon. America's domestic shift to a war footing is underway now and the secret Pentagon plans for nuclear war will soon be in their final weeks. Topic No. 3 Early this month on July 6, the Israeli Government announced that American troops would soon be sent to Lebanon if necessary. Hours later the entity Reagan announced that, yes, in principle he was prepared to send in the Marines as part of a truce agreement. For public consumption, assurances were given that this would be done under certain comforting conditions. Supposedly if the Marines are sent in it will only be temporary to police a truce, not fight, and only if all sides agree to their presence. It all sounds very safe, but to those who know the reality of conditions in Lebanon, the proposal to send in the American troops has a ring of sheer insanity. That's about like trying to smother a fire by dousing it with gasoline. It will be a situation made to order for explosive incidents to widen the war. The following day a letter of warning against sending in the Marines was delivered to Reagan from Soviet President Brezhnev. It was a cryptic warning containing no specific threats. In diplomatic language it simply said, Don't do it. These days anti-war warnings from Moscow are becoming increasingly urgent and frequent. On July 7 the Brezhnev warning against sending United States Marines into Lebanon was issued, and only six days later the Ustinov warning against an American nuclear first strike was issued, which I described in Topic No. 1. Russia's anti-war warnings include not only words but also deeds. Today's Kremlin is run by men who know that words without deeds are useless against the Bolsheviks. That's why I gave a warning last month that Russian preemptive measures could be expected to start taking place. Those preemptive measures are underway now, my friends, in the form of warning strikes to send a message. The first of these warning strikes took place late last month on Sunday morning, June 27. Millions of Americans watched the launch of Space Shuttle 4 that morning on television 
We watched until the two solid rocket boosters separated and fell away from the shuttle. Moments later a Jumbo Cosmosphere, which was pacing the shuttle from a distance, fired two quick blasts at the falling boosters, which were no longer visible on TV. The Cosmosphere's beam weapon blew a hole in the side of each $18 million booster shell. An Air Force C-130 airplane was tracking the boosters and saw their parachutes open, but when the spent boosters hit the water they just kept right on going. Thanks to the holes which had been blown in their sides, they did not float. Recovery teams watched helplessly as $36 million worth of space hardware sank in several thousand feet of water. Embarrassed NASA officials have tried to explain away the loss of the two Shuttle boosters with the lie that the parachutes did not open. The odds are astronomical against the parachutes failing that way on both boosters but they have no other excuse that they dare give the public. Meanwhile the Russian message was clear. Had they cared to, the Russians could have destroyed the shuttle itself on nationwide television, no less, instead of the boosters. Next came the Aerofolk crash in Moscow, followed by the reprisal on July 9 against the Pan Am jet in New Orleans. Both events were acts of war, the secret war which both sides are beginning to mention in public. The Russian message to the Bolsheviks here was, You are not as secure as you think you are. Six days later the Russians reminded the Bolsheviks here of their combined capabilities in geophysical warfare and widespread sabotage here. In the spring of 1977 I began reporting on a Russian campaign of planting nuclear mines where they can destroy countless dams around the United States. Those devices are still there, my friends, waiting for use at the press of a button in Russia. But the Bolsheviks here believe those weapons are all a big bluff, that today's anti-war Russian leaders will never use them. So on July 15 the Kremlin said, Think again to the Bolshevik Pentagon. That day northern Colorado was reeling from incredible rainstorms, the product of Russian weather modification. Dams in the area were straining to hold back the onslaught of water. Then a low-yield underwater nuclear mine was detonated at the base of the Lawn Lake Dam. The dam blew open, and the floodwaters rampaged down the canyon and through the resort town of Estes Park. Afterwards the government tried to cover its tracks by saying they had been worried about that dam, but the disaster actually came with absolutely no warning because the dam was ruined instantly by the Russian mine. The very next day there was still another Russian warning shot. This time it was couched in the centuries-old language of naval warfare, updated to the Space Age. When confrontations take place at sea, there are times when a warship will fire a shot across the bow of another ship. The shot is aimed to barely miss the ship, whistling past just in front of it. A shot across the bow, my friends, is perhaps the most unmistakable military message on the face of the earth. It means, Halt immediately or you will be destroyed. On July 16 a United Airlines DC-10 took off from Boston, bound for Los Angeles. Among the passengers of the big jet were certain key members of the Bolshevik ruling group here in America. For a while the flight progressed without incident. But as the jet flew westward at 39,000 feet, a Russian Cosmosphere was stationing itself to intercept it. The Cosmosphere hovered several miles off to one side of the jet's flight path and a few hundred feet above it. The charged Particle Beam weapon of the Cosmosphere was aimed horizontally to fire a shot across the bow of the speeding DC-10. As the jet approached, the Cosmosphere crew charged up the beam weapon for a maximum energy blast in the defocused mode. As I revealed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 29, this produces a violent air blast like those heard that winter along America's east coast and elsewhere. At precisely the right instant the Cosmosphere fired its shot across the bow of the oncoming DC-10. The tremendous air blast just above the DC-10's altitude created a huge shock wave of downward racing air. An instant later the DC-10 flew into it. Passengers later told reporters, 
that they had heard a big bang. Then the whole plane shook as it was squashed downward as if by a giant hand. Everyone not wearing a seat belt was thrown to the ceiling, which is a long way on a DC-10. Many people were hurt, several seriously. Then the episode was over as quickly as it had started. The jet flew on to Los Angeles without further incident, but to certain individuals on the plane the airborne shot across the bow was meant as a clear warning. The Russians were saying, Halt now in your war plans or you will be destroyed. The latest in the series of Russian warning shots took place on July 22. It was aimed squarely at the weapons specialists among the Bolsheviks here. That day the first full-range test flight of the Army's new Persian II missile took place at Cape Canaveral. The Persian II is the nuclear missile which the Reagan Administration wants to place in Europe where it can attack Russia. Europe will be used as a launching pad. A few seconds after the Pershing II lifted off from Cape Canaveral, it was bathed in neutron radiation from a Russian Cosmosphere high above. As I've explained in the past, neutron radiation totally deranges all kinds of electronic equipment. As a result, the Pershing II's guidance system went crazy. The climbing missile flopped over on its side then started cartwheeling through the Florida skies. Seventeen seconds after liftoff, the Range Safety Officer pushed the self-destruct button and the missile blew up. The Russian message to the Bolsheviks here was very plain, my friends. The plans to use missiles to help destroy Russia will not succeed. The attempt to do so will only rain destruction on America itself. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've reported on the growing momentum toward NUCLEAR WAR ONE. All five tracks of the complex plan of the American Bolsheviks to bring on NUCLEAR WAR are coming together on schedule. Here in the United States a shift onto a war footing is taking place as we are being psychologically conditioned for war to come. The collapse of General Alexander Haig's anti-war coup d'etat last month has left the field of battle to the Bolsheviks here versus the Kremlin, so the Russians are now mounting a campaign of anti-war warnings in both words and deeds. All this is going on as leaders of both sides have started saying in public that America and Russia are already at war. The warning shots fired across America's bow in recent days are very clear. The question is, will the Bolsheviks here heed these warnings and back away from their nuclear war plans? The answer to that, my friends, is being written in blood in war-torn Lebanon. Tiny Lebanon used to be the Switzerland, the jewel of the Middle East. Beirut was a beautiful, peaceful city and a center of trade and finance. The mountains were dotted with the famous cedars of Lebanon and with serene, picturesque villages populated by a gentle and friendly people. The valleys of Lebanon, especially the Bekaa Valley, were indescribably lush with fruits and vegetables. The Zionists in Israel coveted all of it, and so using the PLO as an excuse, they have invaded at last. In order to control Lebanon, they must first destroy it, and that is what they are doing. Each new wave of Israeli bombing leaves more people without homes, more small children maimed, crying, in shock. Israeli-run concentration camps in South Lebanon are full of prisoners with large crosses painted on their backs. Food, water, and medical attention have been denied by the Israelis to many victims of their blitzkrieg, and all the while the United States Government continues to support the Begin War. Can you imagine? Three days ago the Palestine Liberation Organization Chief Yasser Arafat gave a signed document to a group of American Congressmen that implies acceptance of Israel's right to exist. Israel dismissed it instantly as a propaganda ploy and promptly intensified the bombing of Beirut. Likewise, the Bolshevik Reagan Administration waved aside the Arafat statement as, quote, ridiculous propaganda. Unquote. My friends, if either the United States or Israel seriously wanted to end the bloodshed, 
any opportunity to negotiate would be considered. The joint Reagan-Bagan rejection of the Arafat Peace Overture can only mean one thing. The Reagan-Bagan Axis does not want peace. They want war. So the days ahead, my friends, will be very dangerous indeed. And as Thomas Jefferson once said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.